evening. Um, the Buddha analyzed a being into what we call in English five aggregates, five kandhas, which we did look at before, but I will happily refresh your memories. Form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. So we can call that mentality and materiality. Form is the physical form, the, the body. That is made up of four primary elements and 24 secondary elements. Four primary elements, solidity, fluidity, heat, and motion. All of those four are present to, in varying proportions in every material thing. Your cup of tea. Not a lot of solidity, but certainly there's fluidity. At the moment there's heat, but leave it for a few minutes and it'll go cold. And there can be motion or movement. If you think about um, the ocean, for example, there again you've got plenty of fluidity, there's a temperature, and the sea is in motion. And there is an element of solidity there as well. If you jump into a swimming pool, you feel the impact as your body hits the water. That is because of the element of solidity in the water. If the temperature of the water is reduced, eventually the water changes so that the fluid element is very low and the solidity element is very high. You've got ice. On the other hand, you can heat your water up and you have the opposite effect. Um, there you've got a lot of heat and you've got a lot of motion but less of the solidity and the fluidity. But every material thing consists of, in varying proportions, these four elements. And then derived from the elements, the four primary elements, there can be as many as 24 secondary elements. And not one of these things lasts for longer than a split second. To the naked eye, yes, we think things are solid. We think this pen, yeah, solid pen, been here since we started the class. But investigated, and you find actually there's change going on. There's nothing solidly existing. That's the that's the form, the, the physical body side of things. Then we have four kandas making up mentality. Feeling, perception, mental formations, consciousness. Feeling. Feeling is, when we looked last week at the condition genesis, arising from contact, there is feeling. This is really a sensation, not so much feeling, which is a complex emotion. This is the sensation which is arising when an object 
comes into contact with one of our senses. So when a sound strikes your ear, we can adjudge this sound to be attractive, unattractive, pleasant, unpleasant. And then perception. Perception is a process. It takes place when there is contact between the sense door and the appropriate object. So the ear door comes into contact with the sound and that sound is then perceived. So we have different forms of perception depending on which sense that process has stimulated. So we have visual perception, auditory perception, gustatory perception, etc. One for each of the senses. Then we have the mental formations, the sankharas. Fifty different mental qualities which give characteristics to the state of consciousness. Some are wholesome, some are unwholesome. I mean, you can have qualities like love and kindness and compassion. You can have anger, ill will, and greed. You can have um, more neutral things like concentration, attention. But they also arise at the moment of consciousness. So the fifth of these um, kandas is what is called consciousness. Consciousness is not something which exists all the time. It's not a constant. It is simply arising when conditions create it. So when a sense door is stimulated by its appropriate object, then a particular kind of consciousness arises. So when um, something that you can taste strikes the tongue, then gustatory consciousness arises. If it's a smell striking the nose, olfactory consciousness has arisen. So you have one form of consciousness for each of the senses. But this consciousness arises and passes away in a split second. And this is very important because this helps us to begin to understand this doctrine of anatta and a nature as well, that there is nothing enduring here. We perceive things in a misguided fashion. We take what is impermanent to be permanent because of our ignorance, our non-understanding. We don't see things, and this is a little phrase we have, we don't see things as they really are. Ultimate understanding, ultimate knowledge, is to see things as they really are. How are things? They are anicca, dukkha, anatta. But we don't see that because our perception is not sharp enough. The Buddha talked about the five aggregates. And he said that they are all 
changing from moment to moment. And to help us understand their ephemeral nature, uh, he said that um, the material form is likened to a lump of foam. Foam has no enduring quality to it. It cannot be pounded. And therefore, material form is essentially changing and ephemeral. Feeling is likened to a bubble. The bubble is there for a moment and then bursts. It's gone. Perception is likened to a mirage. If you have a mirage, you don't see things correctly. There's some form of illusion being created. And perception is of the same nature. The mental formations are likened to the trunk of a banana or plantain tree. All of you familiar with the inside of the trunk of a banana tree? Sorry? No. Unlike what we find in most trees, there is no hard center, no trunk. All there is is a, a, a series of um, layers of fiber wound around each other. That's all. If you chop it down, you don't find a piece of wood that you can say, right, that's the heart of the tree. All you find is just these spongy, soft layers of, of, of fiber. And so again, the, the mental formations are likened to the trunk of the plantain tree. And then consciousness is described as an illusion because we don't see things correctly. And the Buddha says that material form, feeling, perception, mental formations and consciousness are impermanent. Whatever causes and conditions there are for the arising of these aggregates, they too are impermanent. How could aggregates arisen from what is impermanent be permanent? They can't be. So, a being made up of these aggregates, there's nothing permanent there. All there is, is the processes of um, rising, coming to change, and ceasing. So there is nothing which is lasting for longer than a finger snap. That's how the Buddha explained it. I don't know if you are familiar with the name Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher. He said, you cannot step twice into the same river. You step into the river, step back onto the bank, step a second time into the river, it's not the same river. It's flowed on. All there is is change taking place. The river is not a constant. It is in a state of perpetual motion. 
So you cannot step twice into the same river. It's a different river. It's moved on. It's changed. And so that is very similar to the Buddhist view of things, except the Buddhists would also say, not only is the river changing, but the you is also changing. That you cannot step twice, because you are different now from the you, the you you were a few moments ago. Even as we sit here now, there is change taking place within us. You're not the same person that you were 30 seconds ago, one minute ago, five minutes ago, an hour ago, a day ago. This raises the, the question. There was a monk, Nagasena, in conversation with a Greek king. Um, in the Buddhist text, he's called King Melinda, but the Greeks, I think, had him as King Menander. And they are discussing this quality of impermanence and the absence of a soul or a self. And the king asks for an analogy. And the monk says to him, Are you the same person today that you were as a child, what, 10 years ago, 20 years ago? I ask you, are you the same person today that you were 20 years ago? Are you a different person? What do you think? Are you the same? No, definitely. Not the same, okay. Are you are you a different person? In some ways. Yeah. Nagasena said Nacha so Nacha Anyo. Neither the same nor another. So you're not <coughs> identical to the person you were twenty years ago. But you're not a totally different person from the person you were 20 years ago. The connection is a process, a process of cause and effect, a process which is going on all the time. That one moment in the stream of either the body or the mind, is the cause for the arising of the next moment. And when that passes away, that is itself the cause for the arising of the next moment. So the only constant thing here is change. Change is going on and on and on. It's not change at random. It's a process of causation taking place here. So, there is a connection between the you of today and the you of 20 years ago. You're not totally different, but there's nothing we can point to today and say this has been there for 20 years. I, mean, I, I think that the cells in the body, for example, are renewing every seven years, something like that. And after seven years, you don't have any any cells remaining from more than seven years ago. So we're trying to see our self as a process, not as a thing. That there is no unchanging, permanent, eternal quality. If you think of the life cycle of a butterfly, 
you start with egg. Egg develops into caterpillar. Caterpillar develops into chrysalis. Chrysalis develops into butterfly. That's a developmental process which is taking place. But you can't say, which I don't think you can say, that there is some, something that was present in the egg which has gone unchanged through this process up to the development of the butterfly. You can't say that, that there's a, a soul or a soul in the butterfly, which has been there all the time. It's, I don't think you, I mean, maybe some people would say that, but uh, I, I don't think it's necessary to, to argue for the existence of a soul to explain how the butterfly develops from the egg. It's, it's a process which goes on and on and on. And throughout that period, there's been nothing unchanging, nothing permanent. Why can't we see this in ourselves? What is the problem? What, what, are they, what, is, what, is, what is the thing that's holding us back? The problem is that this process is taking place with inconceivable rapidity. These changes are taking place so fast that our powers of perception are not acute enough to be able to see one state arising and another state passing away. That one arising, that one passing away. I give you a, an analogy. <laughs> I have to go back a few years, but um, if you went to the cinema, you could watch a film and on the screen in front of you, there would be a person or something that looked like a person. But you knew it wasn't a real person. You knew that was an illusion created by putting a number of individual pictures through a projector at high speed to give you the idea that there is the person. Now, you can see through that illusion. You know it is simply a process of individual little pictures. Something similar is going on in our mind and our body, only at a very much higher speed. There are moments of uh, material form, moments of, of, of consciousness arising and passing away, arising and passing away so rapidly that it creates an illusion, an illusion of a solid being. And so we form the impression of I, me, mine, which is not only false, but it is also a very dangerous misperception. Because once we form the idea of there is an I, then we have three things. Um, tanha, mana, and diti. Tanha. We then say, this is mine. Because I exist, this is mine. Um, or, this I am. And DT, 
this is myself. Those three wrong understandings are the cause of a lot of our problems because having built up the idea of an existing me, a solidly existing me, we then have to look after the me. We have to cherish it. We have to look. We have to defend it when it gets hurt. We have to take care of it. And so a whole raft of further um, ideas comes along in the wake of this misperception. And that is where this is a dangerous misperception because it leads to selfishness, it leads to egotism, it leads to all f negative uh, qualities. And in particular, it means we start to take what is our nature, what is impermanent to be permanent, what is dukkha to be, in fact, a source of happiness, and what has no abiding or lasting soul or self to have a permanent, lasting quality to it. And we also take as beautiful that which is not beautiful. So these four forms of misunderstanding. So the Buddhist path is trying to clear away the misunderstanding so that we can see things as they truly are. That's a little expression I mentioned to you. Um, yata bhuta jnana dasanang. To see things as they really are. Normally we don't see things as they really are. We see things through a fog of delusion and ignorance. So we are, that is the, 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 the ultimate goal of the practice, is to clear away all these clouds of non-understanding so we can see things properly, see things clearly. may remember perhaps the different forms of dukkha, the three kinds. We had dukkha dukkha, um, viparinama dukkha, and sankara dukkha. Dukkha dukkha is straightforward suffering, suffering, the suffering of old age, sickness, death. Those are straightforward, as, as the English word suffering portrays. Viparinama dukkha is the suffering that comes from change, that we try to hold on to things which are impermanent, and then when they change, we get disappointed. We are, we are unhappy to see these changes taking place. And then Sankara Dukkha, the, the dukkha of these conditioned states, of these aggregates which are constantly arising and passing away, but which we would like to grasp onto, to hold onto as evidence of a solidly existing me. And it is here that we have the biggest challenge to understand this. We tend to view ourselves as having a me, an I, as we talk about um, There is, a, there is an I that controls my life. There is an I 
that is in charge. An eye which sees, an eye which feels, an eye which smells, an eye which tastes, an eye which touches. But behind all the events of the day, there is something there which is solid, which is existing. Like a, like a shopkeeper sitting inside his shop. There is an eye inside us which is the, what, what sees and hears and tastes and touches. But if we go back to last week, Conditioned Genesis, that shows us that there is no I. If you can remember those 12 links, nowhere in those 12 links was there anything that could be called I. All you can say is, on account of what does feeling arise? On account of what does craving arise? On account of what does clinging arise? There isn't a me who does the feeling or the craving or the clinging. There's just these impersonal factors constantly arising and passing away. This is quite difficult stuff to get your head around. And that is why you can't, look, the Buddha said that his teaching, is, you can't figure out, you can't think your way to enlightenment. You can have some, as we were talking about during the tea break, you can have some theoretical understanding, but it has to be made direct experience. Then we know that it's true, not just thinking about it or theorizing about it. So the, this, this doctrine of anatta is going against the stream of our normal perceptions. And it's something which we struggle to understand on an intellectual level. But by a technique of meditation, we can come to understand this. But I won't go into that very much at the moment. That's ready for next week. But the process is called Vipassana meditation. And it is trying to help us to see this. So the Buddha's teachings are giving us, amongst other things, a middle path between two very widespread doctrines. Widespread at that time and even up to today. Eternalism and annihilationism. Some people talk about eternalism. There is something eternal within us. A soul or self. And many religions teach that. The opposite end of the spectrum is annihilationism. There's nothing eternal. At death, we are completely annihilated. Nothing goes on at all. Body collapses, mental energy vanishes, we just finish. Just a materialistic view of the world. If you are an eternalist, you'll probably have a belief in a soul or a self, because that is what goes on eternally. If you are an annihilationist, probably 
there will be no belief in the soul because that is that would have to survive and it can't survive if you are an, an annihilationist but the Buddha gives us as in so many things the middle path the middle way there is a process and it is the process which goes on not a soul or a self and this process is one of the nama and rupa, um, body and mind, mentality, materiality, which are constantly changing and going on and on and on. So the Buddha doesn't go, doesn't go along with um, eternalism. It doesn't go along with annihilationism. There is a continuity, but it's a continuity of a process, not a thing. Is this making any, any sense? You're all looking very puzzled, so I suppose that's a good sign. It, this is not easy stuff to, to understand, at least on a theoretical level. Um, but it is something which we eventually we can strive to, to understand from our own experience. We have these two approaches. We have analytical and we have synthetical. The analytical approach to analyze a being into constituent parts, the five khandhas. The five khandhas are then broken down, material form, 28 kinds. Um, the mentality side, um, 53 kinds, is form, feeling, Sorry, feeling, perception, mental formations, a total of 52, and then consciousness, one more. And consciousness is also broken down into 89 types of consciousness. So that is, to, that is a way of analyzing into constituent parts. And once you've done all this very, very in-depth analysis, you still can't find anything permanent. You can't find anything lasting here. It's, it's all just changing, changing, changing. That is the analytical method. The synthetical method is what we saw last week with the Paticca Samupada, condition genesis. That nothing exists independently. It can only exist in dependence upon a prior cause. And that prior cause can only exist in dependence upon a cause which came prior to that. And that cause had a prior cause. And that one had a prior cause. And so on and so on and so on and so on. You never get to the start of all this. So that is trying to help us to see that there's a synthesis of this process of cause and effect going on from moment to moment, from one life to another life, never, never stopping, until and unless we reach the state of enlightenment. And enlightenment, Nibbana, one of the things we could say about Nibbana is that it is permanent. Everything else is impermanent. But Nibbana is not a caused condition. It's not subject to causation. It's not subject to origination. And because it is not subject to origination, it is not subject to cessation. So, Nibbana is the only permanent thing. 
um, the, 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 the Buddha's final words before he passed away were, impermanent are all conditioned things. Work out your own salvation with diligence. So work out your own salvation. No one's going to do it for you. You have to work this out for yourself. But impermanent are all conditioned things. So everything within us and around us is impermanent. There's another verse in the Dhammapada. Um, all conditioned things are impermanent. All conditioned things are unsatisfactory. All dhammas are without self. He uses conditioned things in the first two cases. All conditioned things are anicca. Okay. All conditioned things are unsatisfactory. But he didn't use all conditioned things are without a self. Because somebody could then say, oh yes, but there may be an unconditioned self. Something which is unconditioned, which does have a self. So he used instead, instead of uh, Sankara, he uses the word Dhamma. All Dhammas are without self. And this is a wider term than Sankara. It means all things, both conditioned and unconditioned. There's nothing anywhere which you can say has a self. Because um, it is only conditioned things which are impermanent. It is only conditioned things which are unsatisfactory. But he, he needed a wider term to describe that everything is without self. There's nothing either conditioned or unconditioned. Um, and Nietzsche arises because of a process of conditioning. And, and because of the process going on, things are impermanent. Also, because of this process going on, they are unsatisfactory. The Buddha said that these aggregates, these khandhas, arise and pass away from moment to moment. And he said, as the aggregates arise, decay, and die, so from moment to moment you are born, decay, and die. So when we talk about <clears throat> rebirth, we normally mean by that what happens when we reach the end of our lifespan. 70, 80, 100 years, whatever. But what the Buddha is saying here is that every moment, there is a moment of death and a moment of rebirth taking place. So, from moment to moment, you are born, decay, and die. Because these khandhas arise and they pass away. Death. But another khanda arises, birth. That decays, dies. So you can look at this, um, this doctrine of rebirth 
on two time scales. You can look at rebirth from moment to moment, here and now. As we sit here now, there is death, decay, or decay, death, dying, and rebirth taking place. Or you can expand the time scale to what we regard as the normal length of a human life. So you've got two, two perspectives on that. I think it's also important to introduce one other distinction here. Truth. What I've been talking about for the last um, half an hour or more has been what we might call ultimate truth. But we have another level of truth, what we call conventional truth. Conventional truth is the use of terminology which is agreed on by convention to have certain meanings. And when I talk to you about, say, um, sunrise, you know what I mean by sunrise. I assume you do. Actually, the sun has not done anything. That was just a, a term, sunrise conventionally agreed, but in fact it is the Earth which is moving around the Sun, not the Sun moving around the, the Earth. But it is a very valuable agreed terminology to talk about sunrise or sunset. Good. That's agreement. But in an ultimate sense, that is not true. And so we get a similar situation with the, with the terms you and me. The Buddha used conventional language. He would talk about you do certain things and you will receive the results of your actions. I am teaching you this, that, and so forth. These are conventional terms, and they're very, very necessary for everyday communication. But the words I and you, me, mine, are only convention, relative truth. They're not ultimate truth. Ultimate truth would mean we couldn't talk about me or you. We have to talk about this temporary aggregation of uh, five grasping groups which constantly arise and pass away from moment to moment, working within a process of cause and effect. Well, that might be true, but it's a very long-winded way of saying would you like a cup of tea? So for conventional purposes, we can use terms like you. So there is this difference at different levels. It's almost like different, different languages. One language uses certain terms for describing things. Another language uses different terms to describe things. So we shouldn't confuse these two, we should be aware that for a lot of the time the Buddha was speaking in conventional English, or not conventional English, conventional Prakrit or conventional Pali. So if you look at a lot of the suttas, a lot of the discourses, yeah, words like you and me and I, they crop up all over the place. That was very necessary for day-to-day -day communication. But it is only a convention. So recognize there is another 
deeper um, level of truth. And is that, that is what we're trying to understand. And that is where the practice of uh, meditation can help. Anybody got a question? We're all bored into silence. <laughs> this is one of these kind of uh, what can I say there was a man called Vachagotcha Vachagotta who came to see him and said do I have a self the Buddha remained silent Do I not have a self? The Buddha remained silent. And in the end, Vachagata got up and walked away. I think the reason the Buddha didn't answer those questions is that whichever way he'd answered it would only confuse this poor man further. I, I think he had met this man on one or more previous occasions and then had a discussion on this subject and whatever you say is going to be in some way or other misleading and that was why the, the, he, he's trying to he's trying to avoid causing even more confusion in Vachagotta's mind there is an account of a conversation that takes place between a monk called Kemaka and some of his fellow monks. And Kemaka says uh, that he understands this doctrine of uh, a no self, but Even so, he's still left with this sense of, I am. He says it's like the scent <clears throat> of a flower. You can't say where exactly this scent is coming from. Is it coming from, the, from the, the petals or from the center of the flower? Or is it coming out of the color of the flower? Or you, you don't know where it's coming from, but I still got this, I'm still picking up a scent. And this concept of I is a bit like that. It hangs around. And it doesn't, in fact, become entirely overcome until enlightenment is reached. So up to that point, we are still struggling with the concept. But it is recorded that uh, Kemika did become enlightened. And so um, we can take comfort from that. So, so would you say that the story of Vachagotta that's been like um, some people interpret it as the Buddha saying that there is maybe not that there is not self, but knowing that there is self? Well, I, I think in a conventional sense, we have a self, but we talk about you and me. There is a self, but that's only a convention. And in an ultimate sense, no, there's no self. But the conventional sense of the use of the word self is valuable, helps us to get through the day. We need to be able to communicate. Um, I 
that is, I think, as I said a little bit earlier, maybe this is this is the point about the Buddha's um, teaching of, of enlightenment. Is that you cannot just think or reason your way to enlightenment. It is something which has to be experienced. And you can you can you can sit down and discuss this, and think about it for hours, days, weeks, years, but it's not going to get you there. If you want to give somebody the idea or. What, what, what is the taste of sugar? Someone who's never tasted sugar. You can talk for a, a year on the subject of the taste of sugar. <laughs> They're still not going to give him the taste of sugar. Once it gets a bit of on his tongue, ah, now I know the taste of sugar. So that is the, that is the ultimate truth, when we know something for ourselves. next week. Anything else to say? <laughs>